My name is Adam Gilbert. I'm uh, director of the Early Music Program at the Thornton School of Music at the University of Southern California. Early music is a kind of a strange, large designation of mostly music that's Bach and before. So 1715 before is the generic kind of cutoff point. But it's more than that because a lot of people play Bach who aren't involved in early music. It also has to do with something we are now calling the historical performance movement or the historically informed performance movement, meaning that if I play Bach, the difference between me and a modern player is that I'm having my students play a Baroque violin. And the Baroque violin is different and it has a slightly shorter fingerboard. It has a different bow, which actually the, on the modern violins you don't notice the difference of a down bow and an up bow. It actually sounds different on a Baroque violin. It creates different effects. So our premise is that the closer you get to actually understanding how music was performed and how people thought about performing and also how they improvised, how they thought about composing at a certain time, the more you'll get at the heart of why something's written. Um, so I actually direct the Baroque orchestra here and so we're doing 17th and 18th century music on Baroque violins and lutes and Baroque guitars and older wind instruments, Baroque oboes. But I also specialize in 16th and 15th century improvisation and I play an instrument called a shawm. And a shawm is the Renaissance version of the oboe. It has no, no keys, it just has holes. It's very loud. It was the great wind instrument of the 15th century. It's if you went to a wedding, you'd hear a shawm. If you went to a ducal palace, you'd hear the shawm, and the shawm would be improvising dance music or playing love songs. The shawm is related to uh, the zorna, which is another wedding instrument played in Turkey, the swona in China. It's a double reed instrument. It has a wide double reed like this, but small, with a little thing in your a disc you put on the outside of your mouth. It's got a big bell that looks trumpet-like, and it's pretty loud and piercing. The Shanai in India is a relative. So, A couple of things happened was one that you had these instruments as folk instruments all the way through history. Um, the, the instrument I play called the, the Shom is a conical bore instrument but there's a cylindrical bore instrument that's related called the Duduk and that's played by a man named Zivan Gasparian in, um, in an Armenian musician who you can hear on recordings. That's in The Passion of the Christ. That is a certain sound associated with the Middle Eastern style of instrument. Well, that tradition goes all the way back to ancient Greece with an instrument called the aulos. If you look at the Khalil in the Bible, when it says these are the psalms to the flute, psalms of David for the flute players, that word is Khalil, and that's actually that instrument. So that's an instrument that people have played for since whenever somebody had a piece of reed on the side of the water. Um, so you see, you still see people playing those in folk traditions, but many of those folk traditions were almost killed in in the 1900s, World War One. I. Um, I also played bagpipes. Bagpipes were all over Europe until until World War One or so, and then especially World War Two, with fascist governments in Spain tried to shut down any of the culture of bagpiping because that was considered to be Galician and not Spanish particularly. So. What happened was a lot of these players died off and then in the 1970s you'd have two 80-year-old guys left and now those traditions have come back from those 80-year-old guys have taught a young generation. So if you go to Spain now, you can find a bagpipe player on every street corner in the north. And if you say, wow, you're a real bagpiper. Oh yeah, I'm okay, but the guy down the street is even better than I am. So you can follow the trail until you get to the guy who actually makes the instruments. And it's, that's sort of what's happening now. So there is a revival, but there are also the instrument I play, the shawm, became the oboe, so it's not, it's still played in the orchestra today. It's just tooled up with keys and more, more bells and whistles. Um, my version of the instrument is about so long, I should have brought it in here. It's about this long. It's very loud. You wouldn't want to hear it this close. Um, and the original folk version is about this long, and it went over on Columbus's ship to um, Central America, so you actually see it in Colombia and Guatemala as a folk instrument as well. My first memory is I wanted a clarinet because I saw Benny Goodman on TV. And that was when I was five or six years old. And I had no idea what a clarinet was. I just saw him and I really liked it. And I really liked Louis Armstrong. And I remember liking kind of instruments, people playing and wind instruments. Um, I got a recorder when I was eight years old on the premise that if I showed that I could play that I'd get a clarinet. And I played Go Talent Roadie for three years. And that's all I did. I just played Go Talent Roadie over and over and over, drove my family crazy. I got a clarinet. I joined the band in high school and in middle school and, f and fifth, sixth grade. 
and played that. And when I was 13, I went and I, uh, to a Collegium concert at a local university. And I went to USC, but not this one. I went to University of Southern California. So I always liked it. I came from USC to USC. And I saw the Collegium, which is the early music ensemble. South Carolina. University of South Carolina, yeah. And uh, I saw a concert of somebody playing Handel sonatas with harpsichord and recorder. And the moment that, you know that movie, The Jerk with Steve Martin? where he hears the music that's really music and he starts tapping his feet. My Steve Martin moment was uh, hearing um, dances by Martin Praetorius, no, sorry, not Martin, from by Michael Praetorius, who was a composer from Germany around early 17th century. He collected Renaissance dances from Europe. And the dance that I remember the most was a dance called a courant, a running dance of, you know, leaping like running. And it went like this. It's really famous. Bum 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 I heard that and it was just that was it. And I was thirteen years old, I went to the music library, there's a very strange librarian there, I won't say his name, because he's a strange man, but he showed me where that book was and I Xeroxed all the ones and I still can tell you I remember four of those dances and I knew them by heart the moment I heard them. I mean, I didn't know the whole songs, but I knew the melodies that I could find them in the book. They were so striking to me. So that was the moment that I started playing early music, and I met two old social workers from Brandeis University who played recorder also, and, and then somebody else who played Martin guitar. So we started a group of... I learned how to play with all these college professors and social workers doing 15th century music, and we played on accordion, an 1850 Martin guitar, and on recorders. And I remember that. And we used a trash can for a drum when we played dances. And that's how I learned this music. So, Well, the same time that I started doing music, I started doing local theater. And the first play I got a, a part in was I got a part playing recorder. It was a production of Samuel, of, of Thomas, it was a production of Beckett by Jean Aoui. You know, that show about Henry II and, and Thomas Beckett. And I played recorder and I played those, those dances. And uh, what I remember, the strange thing about it was around the same time and the the theater director brought me this recording, and one of those dances was on the recording. I said, I could do that. Da, da, da. So I did that. A month later, I did another play at another local school. So I started out doing theater, and those kind of went along sideways, and I did lots of kiddie theater, and I did some educational television. And then at my first year of college, I had a choice of joining a local theater company that did musicals for children and traveled around South Carolina and Georgia and stuff, or going off to music school in New York. And I, that was just one of those moments. I think I'd gotten ditched by my first girlfriend, and I was feeling like, what am I going to do next, and where is the world going to take me? And I had to kind of weigh those, like, am I going to be a theater person, or am I going to go into music? And I, uh, I had turned down a possibility of going to Juilliard for acting because I didn't have enough money to go. But then I ended up going to another school that every time Juilliard raised its rates, that this was Manus College of Music in New York, they would raise their rates. Now I'll tell you that story, because this is a good one. I went up to New York. Let's see, turn the tape on. And I had gone to uh, NYU, and I'd call them, and I said, I hear, you know, you guys used to have this collegium, this group called New York Pro Musical. It was the early music group. So I, they sent me around to different departments, and finally somebody said, come up, we'll give you a special audition. So on th around Thanksgiving, I went to do, it's 1980, I think, I went to do an audition. I showed up, and the auditioner never showed up. And then the chair of the department brought me and said, well, you know, the auditioner couldn't show up because of traffic. And, well, we really can't give you a special program. And besides, you can never expect a bright future in early music. And so I got mad, and I had been waiting for so long, and I wanted it so bad. I, I banged on her desk, and I, I've only done this once again in my life. I banged on her desk, and I said, if anybody can expect a bright future in early music, I can. And I stormed out the door. The day before, I'd heard about a place called Manus College of Music, and I walked all the way up from 14th Street to 74th Street um, and went in, and I'd heard that they had a program, and I knocked on the door, and I went to the admissions office, and there was a girl there, and she said, oh, you play recorder? I play recorder, too. My boyfriend plays harpsichord, so I started going to school the next January, a month later. I auditioned for school there, and it turns out the president of the school was a guy who really liked early music, and he hired a bunch of teachers for the program, and nobody had come yet. And so when I walked in, he said, well, I guess we're going to have to bring the teachers in. So he brought the teachers, and he brought a director, a guy named Paul Eccles, who was a really great musician, and that's who I studied with there, among other people. But he ran 17th century operas and was kind of an evil genius person. So. Well, as director of early music program, I have, um, I have 
several things I do. Um, one is the first, mo most important one, I guess, is directing the Baroque Orchestra. And I don't conduct it. It's, it has, um, we have, uh, I think we have some violinists who are in a very nice scholarship from the Colburn Foundation to actually be minoring. They're modern violinists who are learning how to play Baroque violin. We also have majors who have come here specifically to study professional early music. And so I have an orchestra that is a, with violins and cellos and viola de gambas and harpsichord and voices. That ensemble goes between 20 and 25 people for, for a concert. And we do four concerts a, a year. So I also have another group that's called the Collegium. We do more Renaissance music um, that meets a little less often. It's less professional oriented. Um, so the, this early music ensemble is called the Thornton Baroque Symphonia, and we do these concerts. We rehearse twice a week for three hours a day, so we're six hours a week, which is very generous for most, most early music programs. And I coach them and harangue them and work with them, and then they get up on stage and do it. And I play maybe a couple of pieces with them or something, but it's really their, their show. Um, I also have been bringing people for master classes because violinists don't always want to hear from a recorder player. <laughs> so today I actually have for this concert tomorrow uh, a very fine Baroque violinist named Julie Andrzejewski who plays, is one of the great professionals, and Stephen Stubbs is a really big lute player, guitar player, and opera director will be there in this performance. This is our big gala of end of the year. And I also have an oboe band, a Baroque oboe band. And this is, a, this is for me such a proud moment because since I play early double reeds, I actually haven't had time to teach them at all. But I have a couple of people who've minored in Baroque oboe, and this year, the two of them, they're graduating. They said, well, let's start an oboe band. So they've just started bringing people in, and I just handed out the instruments. And they've been playing. I have a colleague named Deborah Nagy who comes in when she's in town for gigs, and she's been coaching them a little bit. And they're giving their first performance tonight as an oboe band, which is a group of six or seven people playing 17th century dance music and they used to play marches for the soldiers in the 17th century, so they're going to get up and do their thing, and there's nothing quite like that sound. Every year, I think I have about eight people who are majoring here, who are already determined that's what they want to do. And then I have maybe 10 people who are minoring, and I think what's interesting about the minors is that's often really some of the most fertile ground for people ending up doing this professionally. So two of my minors are a few years ago, before I was here, because this is my first year doing this job, um, are now majors. And so some of the people who start on guitar and end up playing lute and bro guitar end up, that becomes more of their focus. So not like we're trying to steal them, but it's just, you know, some, it appeals to some people. So I think, you know, we have 8, 10, 12 people going that way at any given time. In general, there are several places that you can do this. Um, there is a, there's kind of a, Early music has a niche in the chamber music scene, which is where if you go to concert series, every chamber concert series has an early music concert. They, if you go to a college series, they might have a classical string quartet, they might have a jazz ensemble, they might have a taiko drum, then they'll have an early music group. That's a very common kind of eclectic concert series. So you could go do concert series, and I think a standard small chamber ensemble amount of concerts a year on one of those series is uh, maybe anywhere between 15 and 50 concerts a year. Um, some groups do quite a lot. Some do, I think a common average would be 25 to 35 concerts a year doing those kinds of things. Um, school shows, um, audience outreach concerts. There's also a whole scene of Baroque orchestra. So for string players and oboe players, there's, there's, there are Baroque orchestras in Los Angeles, Portland, Seattle, the Bay Area. Um, New York, Boston, uh, Cleveland, Chicago area. I'm not, I'm not so sure about Chicago. They're, they're ensembles, but I don't know about Baroque Orchestra. So there are scenes that all these people are going around and doing gigs, playing for opera, con for opera concerts of Baroque operas, and playing for regular series of Baroque orchestras. There are other small ways to make people teach. People also play for weddings and funerals and gigs, or play for festivals. Another another thing that you can make. Money is going to Europe for festivals in the summer. Um, so it's a, it's a field that has those certain places where people are making the, the regular gigs, but then there are all these little circles of ways people are making money and working together and doing things. As far as film music goes, that's I think, has been less something people in this business do. 
um, we're hoping to change that. Um, one of the nice things about USC is that we've already started working with some of the people at the film scoring department, and uh, there's a nice young man here named Patrick Kirst, who should interview, he's a um, composition person, and he called me up and he came by my office and he started looking at my instruments. He said, well, what is this key in and what key is this in? And then he asked me to play some pieces he wrote very quickly for a stage production here. And that was very nice because he said, look, if I have an English horn and I want to make use the English horn to sound like I'm in Israel and at the time of you know, the crucifixion, that's one thing. But if I have an instrument that sounds even more folky, it gives me more flavor. So he's been interested in that. And I've met with his students. So my hope is that we have something to give also to people who are doing composition. Um, another angle of that is that m one of my focuses is Foci? Foci? I can't have... Uh, never mind. Is, um, is early improvisation and early compositional process. And so both for composition people, for jazz people, I think early music has a great um, resource to offer because if you recreate a compositional process from 1500, there are things you learn about the way people looked at music and thought about it. Um, and that's also the next movement in my field. Up to now, people have been playing old pieces. But much of the old music being made from 1700 and before was improvised. And improvised with very, very set rules. We know what the rules we're doing. We have examples of what people were doing. And we have examples of, we have rule books for how they did it. And the closer you get to recreating that practice, the more you kind of get in the mindset of why a composed piece is that way. That that's actually just the tail of another dog. So that's been very exciting dealing with. I also teach courses in his music history. And one of the courses I taught last semester was 15th century improvisation. And that was the, some of my best students were jazz students. One thing people did in the 15th century was if they wrote a song, they'd refer to somebody else's song for a very specific reason. The same way Noel Coward and Cole Porter. Cole Porter wrote, when, she, when we begin to begin, begin to begin, and, and Noel Coward write a song about Nina from Argentina who didn't want to dance, she refused to begin the begin. So he'd make, f they did this in the 15th century too. And the best students I had at actually finding those references and recognizing things was jazz students because they recognize people doing motives and things. So it's a nice place we have to meet. Yeah, well, first of all, this is the simplest thing. This is a recorder. And this is, if you think of a recorder when you're in school, it's about the same size, but it has more turns and, and like nicely turned furniture leg. That's actually because that's a Baroque style of instrument. This is a copy of instrument around 1600 or 1620. Um, so it's a little bit different. And this is, a, they used to just call this the flute or the flauto dolce. The, the recorder comes from the word remember, recordare, because that's what birds did to their mother's song. They remembered them. Um, this was probably the simplest of the simplest and was associated with shepherds and things. But people also played variations on this. So for instance, I might play a tune like, uh, uh, I might go like this. Up, but you get the idea. I could do divisions. Green Sleeves, for instance, a favorite recorder piece. If I go. But another version of Green Sleeves is. That's a variation on Green Sleeves. Same chord progression. Um, now. Here's an instrument that has an oboe inside. Conical board chanter, it's got some tuning tape on there. You don't, pretend you don't see that. Um, and it... Because I play it in a bag, I'm blowing it in a bag, I can't articulate with my tongue like I do on other wind instruments, as I did on the recorder. So I use my fingers, and listen to this. This is not going to be perfectly in tune because I didn't know you wanted me to play bagpipes today. So another way of tuning this is to play a very short melody note. Now, 
This is the chanter. It means that's the singer. The word cantare, you know that word, chant? That's the part that sings. And here is the drone. And you're going to notice this is, okay, this is made out of plastic and metal, but the original drones like this were just made out of cane with a tongue slid out by a knife. And that's the origin of the clarinet style reed. There's a kind of bagpipe called the hummelshin, which means the little bumblebee, because this is called the hummel, the drone. Uh, you know that composer Hummel? And now I've got a shoelace that I borrowed from one of my students when my strap broke. This is just to keep my... This is going to be one thing that's going to be different from what you think of Highland pipes. My drone is going to stick out in front. in tune yet, but you get the idea. I've got a, my bag keeps the air pressure like a football, and then the air goes out of these two tubes. The name for the bagpipe, actually, there are lots of names. Dudelzak means duduksak, a, a flute with a sack, a pipe with a sack. But zamponia means sound together, symphonia. But another word, gaida, means goat. Gaida huh. comes from the Semitic root of the word gadi. Okay. Gadi, which is goat body, and you'll actually see that the guy that has the horns and the whole thing. And when you inflate that, little bones inflate out of that thing, and it looks. This is the bagpipe chanter, and removed from the bagpipe chanter with a double reed, same same kind of reed in there. And this reed, when I blow into it, it crows. This is what's called the crow. That's the reed vibrating, opening and closing. Now here it is, a little more control. And that's really working like my vocal cords, I think. And then I put it on this amplifier, and that's what makes the, this is the instrument that is the, the Renaissance version of the oboe, it's the shawm. This is, I think of this instrument in one of two ways. I either think I'm playing in C like a soprano instrument, or in G like a G alto kind of instrument, depending on the music I'm reading. But in fact, the bottom note is D. But in fact, the bottom note is D at A465 which means it's a modern E-flat. So they didn't think the same pitch as we did, same ways, and they differed by instruments. But this is a, um, this was that instrument they used for improvising dance tunes over dance music. And I'll give you just a little, here's what it sounds like. instrument very directional you can see if will I kill you if I do this here's a direction how so this is really made for outdoor playing they're made to play in in pairs of shams or in trios or quartets with trombones or trumpets and they're made to play really pure intervals so when you hear a fifth on this a pure fifth boom, it rings out um, improvisational style they use syncopation things like this So they call this instrument the dulcian, or the fagot, which means sticks, fags of wood together, or the bachon, bassoon. This is the mm. French started calling this the bassoon in the 17th century. Mm. But here, let's see. Doesn't have the same range as a modern bassoon. I can't really do right of spring on it too well. I can't quite get up to right of spring on this, but um, 
you can you can see the instrument quality is a little beefier than a little less refined from our modern standpoint but it it cuts through an ensemble of shams and this was this was an instrument that was also popular using for doing variations if i go <laughs> tell you this the audience for this is a strange conglomeration of people who like classical music but it's not just the classical people it's sometimes maybe the people like me who went, when they heard this old old music it was new for them um, so you get a certain crowd it's a small but loyal crowd in the states it's much bigger in Europe there are nationalistic reasons the early music scene in Europe tended to go very much by country the Dutch were interested in Baroque music because it was later the Dutch Republic the great era the French were interested in French Baroque music. The Belgians were interested in polyphonic music because 15th and 16th century was the time where the great musicians were trained in the area of Belgium. Italians were interested in Palestrina and Mono Verdi. So you have these really strong people focusing on that music, and that's part of the whole culture in classical music in Europe. Ours tends to be a little more of a niche market, but there's, there's also a lot of interest when I pick up one of these if somebody comes to a concert who's a folk fan. They get interested in it. People who like early music also tend to like Celtic music. Um, people who like opera often like early opera, but there tends to also be a divide. People who like, you know, opera, you know, Verismo and some bel canto as opposed to people who like early opera, etc. Um, there's also a kind of funny thing that happens on the East Coast and West Coast. They're different countries because it takes as long to fly from here to New York as it does to anywhere. But having said that, a lot of people travel back and forth to the coasts, and there's some middle middle country work, but people tend to get little communities in small towns and then bring people in for other things. But the West Coast and East Coast have something similar, is that they have these trains of cities that do things, and I always laugh because Boston has a really special quality of being an early music city. And everybody thinks Boston is a much more early music city because there are more renowned things happening there than there are in New York. But there's actually a lot more work in New York if you're in the business. There are a lot more circles of people doing it in all kinds of ways you can make a living. And the Bay Area has a much more strong reputation for being an early music center than Los Angeles. Um, and yet, oddly enough, there's also quite a lot of ways to make a living and work here. They're, they're not always the ways you think. So yes, you are more likely to say, I, I need to show them for a movie um, and have that kind of business aspect of music down here as opposed to the early music scene. Mm -hmm. um, both New York and Los Angeles also have that problem of being a little less centralized. There's a lot of things going on. So what is the downside is also an opportunity. There's so many more places for you to do things. So.